What's up? What's up, y'all? Once again, it's a Koski of Funday. I'm back at it once again. And I'm still continuing on with this subject right here. This is probably going to be the last video of it until, you know, something else happened or whatever, blah, 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 they split, whatever. But this is what um, Africans in the Americas, you know, I'm about the Aboriginal scholarship and things of that nature, you know what I'm saying? So I'm taking from black scholars and black scholars only about what they got to say about the settlers, about black people being here in the Americas. All right? You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm saying. This time it's the Grand Master teacher, historian, in my mind, Dr. John Henry Clark. And we all know Dr. John Henry Clark got to, you know, a pretty long list of track records of doing things for his people. So what do you want to say about this, Amer you know, about black people being Indians and things of that nature, and they're not African, even the people that live over here in the Americas, because there were black here in the Americas, but, you know, the conversation is they're not African. So what does he have to say about this stuff? I'm wondering. And he got a couple He got a couple works on this thing. So for people that are saying that, you know, backing up their plan, they said that Dr. John Hay Carter had no things on this. Yeah, he got a couple of things. I'm just pulling out one of them. You know, I'll hold the rest of the bullets for later. You know what I'm saying? But in this one, he's, he, got, he got, like I said, he speaks on this subject about, you know, black Indians are not African or are they African or not. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to take a look into that. Hey, some people feelings might get hurt, but it's a scholarship. It got to get done for the perfect reason. And this is a well-known historian. It ain't no boule made up monkey stuff dot com or whatever, whoop de whoop and, you know, ain't no need to name them guys all that come with that bogus scholarship. It ain't no made up thing like that. I'm pulling from black historians that you can look up yourself. I make sure I put the description in the inbox. So you can look it up yourself and see what it is all about. You know what I'm saying? So if you don't like me reading it, you can read it your damn self. All right? Now, as you see here, this is from Black World. You know, Black World, November 1975. Black World was a damn good magazine back in this day. All right. Notes on the following pages. Dr. John Henry Clark. Professor at the Both Hunters College in Africana Studies and Research at Cornell University, provides an evaluation of the shaping of Black America in the content of author Leon Burnett Jr.'s Body of Historical Writing and History of Black People in the Americas. All right. The Shaping of Black America. In his previous, so this is basically, before I get into this, this is basically Dr. John Henry Clark taking his work and you know, boosting his work of Leon Labora Bennett, Jr., you know what I'm saying? The Shaping of Black America. In his previous book, The Challenge of Blackness, 1972, Leon Bennett said, if black people are not what white people said we are, were, then white America is not what it claimed to be. We have to therefore deal in this contestation at a level of reality. We are engaged in a struggle over meaning, a struggle over truth. And it is my argument here that blacks and not whites embody the common interest in the truth of American society. In the collective way, this but the present book, The Shaping of Black America, Johnson Publishing, is about. In a general way, this is what all the books of Leon Bennett are about. This book requires is a contradiction of American society and its relation to black people. Leon Bennett writes history, social science, and political science, and engages in prophecy all at the same time. In his books, he shows he has mastered more than history as a subject. He has mastered the art of good writing and knows how to make a story come alive and communicate with the people who have no prior knowledge of the subject. His times reflect a special kind of development that needs to be looked at, at least briefly, if we are to understand the achievements as a social historian. He is of that new generation of relentless Black Americans who have given birth to class the Black Revolution. This movement literally demands a reevaluation on the part of the people of African descent that played in the making of America in their circumstance that brought them here. In his first book, Before the Mayflower, 1961, Bennett began to ask the man a reevaluation of Afro American history. The book ended up with a warning that is also a prophecy. If we do not stand up and create, that, create an America, that was dream, he said, if we not to begin to flesh out the words of the creed, the commonwealth of silence will become a definite and an apocalyptic look at the end. In his writings, Bennett brings the reader face to face with the uncomfortable truth about America's racial conflict. This is the essence of his value of a social historian. 
The Shaping of America represents the firing of a talent. And all his previous books seem to have been part of a preparation for writing of this book. It's most profound commentary to date on the nature of the Black experience. He calls his book an essay toward understanding and continuing attempts of the African and African's descent to possess themselves in the new land. Quotations, new land. He calls attention for the need and a conceptual envelope for Black American history. He further states, and it should be clear by now to almost everyone in understanding, the Black experience requires new concepts and radical new perspectives. At once, Bennett demonstrates what he means by new concepts and rally new perspectives in the opening chapter of his book called The First Generation. Because as he said, Blacks lived in a different time and a different reality in this country. It should then stand a reason that the most honest interpretation of their history requires a different insight and a different frame of reference. The book begins like a promising drama lead to the reader through the experience that is more and more worth in time. The promise that begins to fill itself at the end of the first page of the first chapter of the following passage. In August, when the shadows are long on the land and even the air presses, the fury of fate hangs in the balance of Black America. It's in August of the eighth month of that year, 300,000 men and women marched on Washington. It was August that Watts exploded. It was in August on that hot and heavy day in the 19th century that Nat Turner rolled, and it was another August. 344 years before the march on Washington, 346 years before Watts, and 112 years before Nat Turner War, that a Dutch man of war sailed up the James River and landed the first generation of Black Americans in Jamestown. The Dutch ship and its cargo had hence changed forth and we come to the United States in such a way henceforth and never be made the same again. The seeds of the original culture that America can show the world were arriving on this Dutch ship. Also arriving was an embryo conflict that more than 300 years is still unresolved. Then it resolved, refers to this cargo as the black gold that made capitalism promise possible in America. In his reference, he believed it goes off the case. This cargo, black gold, and other cargoes had made other things possible. Naturally, it gave America its means to become a world power, and it naturally created the, best, the basis for the Industrial Revolution and the maiden voyage of science and technology. Bennett reminds us that the drama, which is known as the African slave trade, has been going on for more than 100 years when the gender colony was founded in 1607. All right? Well, it's already been going on for 100 years before the Virginia colony was founded in 1607. In an indirect way that is nonetheless explicit, he is telling us something else. A call to attention another neglected aspect of, of history of slavery. The British who dominated in the middle and the last phase of the slave trade were laying in his foothold in this business. For almost 200 years, the slave trade, the Portuguese and the Spanish dominated. The plantation system in South America and the Caribbean islands were well established before the Virginia colony was founded. Most Europeans who came to America were in conflict with their cultural mooring before they left Europe. The Africans who became their slave were caught in the crossfire of their conflict. Feudalism was ending in Europe, and another system, more politically sophisticated and called capitalism, was beginning. Europe was on the brink of class warfare. This war was averted when some lower class in Europe began to enjoy the many same spoils of conquest as the upper class. The spoils were obtained from the slave trade. Europe dumped its human garbage in the so-called new world. The worst of these mismiths, political and religious malacontents, and social failures were dropped into the English colony that became the United States. From the beginning, a bad seed was planted in this country and was still fighting to reap its bitter harvest. These first Africans were not titled slavery, but indentured servants. This is a major point that is often missed. Bennett deals with this aspect of slavery and researching how very careful to show the indentured person, the slave system, service system, was transformed into child slavery. During this period, the indentured of some first generation blacks became early Americans in many ways. Some of them, owners of the land and slaves. Other parts of the craft and technology class that helped train a young and raw America. Labor was needed, and this is the first black indentures, the first blacks into indentures. The indentured service was not created for blacks who landed in Jamestown, Virginia. The system was long intact before they arrived. There was still a large number of white indentured servants already in the system. Bennett calls attention to the fact that, in theory, the legal status of black immigrants were higher than that first. Whites, indigenous servants. They were brought by public funds. Their labor was used to benefit the county in general and not for any single individual. This first generation of blacks worked side by side with indigenous white servants without conflict. 
Been in no in two out of three white ser- indigenous service die in the first year of the counties. Not a single black die in the first three years. What does it tell us about the physical dentures of the blacks in comparison to the poor European who became indentured servants? Whatever the fault of African society in the early slavery periods, these Africans had neither adequate food, shelter, or clothing, and obviously was something else. This is something else may be likely the key to black survival, a sustained spirituality that made them hold on to life when hope unborn had died. This really distinction between blacks and whites did not develop during the formative years of the slavery system. Then it observes that white masters held the black and white slave laboring classes in equal contempt and exactly the same tributes and the same work from both groups. It was not unusual in these types of a white master to force a white woman servant to marry a black male servant. Nor was it usual for a white master to give a black man a position of authority of a white male or female servants. Some blacks, such as Anthony Johnson, required land and status and owned black and white serv- slaves. Okay. In his chapter, Red and Black, then it discussed the relationship between blacks and so-called Indians and show that both was good and bad. Some blacks joined whites in the fight against the Indians, and some blacks joined the Indians in the fight against the whites. In the Seminole Wars in Florida, black and Indians joined the most meaningful alliance of the group on record. Both about the Seminole Wars, General Thomas Sidney Jessup was moved to sit in the 25th Congress, second session, 1837 to 1838. This, you may be assured, is a Negro, not an Indian war. And if it be not speedily down, the South will feel as effective on the slave population before the end of next season. In this chapter, Bennett recorded the minutes of the meetings between the Reds and the Blacks and how whites used them. It was a working fork of the world that the Indian, African and Indian met and became part of each other and observed reflection of each other's agony. Back there, centuries ago, at the turning of the lands, the African had to labor, the Indian had to land, and the European had to plan, and the necessary firepower. The plan blew the stage what was to be the firepower to take the Indian's land and make the African till it. There could be no understanding of the African or the Indian without some understanding of this fact, for it was meant that crossfire of this plan that the African and the Indian met and molded each other. These are the minutes of the seconds and not of the first meeting. The evidence of the first meeting, the pre-Columbian presence of Africans in the so-called New World, is now more significant and more pervasive. We no longer have to handle this relationship or leave it in the area of debate. New books and monograms on the subject have put the debate in doubt to rest. It is at this point that we reveal that has gone beyond the content of Bennett's chapter, Red and Black, the order to illuminate its importance. It is necessary to look at the main currents of history that started the forced migration of Africans from their homeland. This, the forced migration that began with the slave trade and the development of the plantation system was the third and not the first of these migrations. The first and second migrations need to be looked at in more detail in order to understand the third migration that is so well known to us. That is so well known to us. We should start with the pre-Columbian presence of Africans in Americas and the Caribbean islands and continue with the assessment of the role of a large number of African sailors technicians, freebooters, and adventures with the Spanish and Portuguese before 1619. The Pre-Columbian presence in the Africans is called the New World has long been a subject of speculation. Any examination of old and new evidence relating to the subject will put the speculation to rest. While this review mainly deals with the second and third impacts on Africans in the Western Hemisphere, it is important that we look at, at least briefly at the first impact of the light from the old and the new evidence. The formal investigation of this subject started in 1920 with the publication of Professor Leo Weiner's Master Three Vine Works, African Discovery in America. The first volume of this work, Professor Weiner, shows American archaeology on both the African and the Indian were built on sands of supposition and chronological cultural development for both of these people is totally out of order. He also shows that the African had a far greater influence on American civilization than before suspected. The second volume of this study, the African religions and their influences on culture in this hemisphere. This documents tend to prove, with an extraordinary strength, that the Indian medicine man owes its evolution from the African medicine man. All right? 
In explaining the diaries of Christopher Columbus, Professor Winter calls attention to the fact that this European explorer meant that he found dark-skinned people in the Caribbean trading with the Indians. Who were these dark-skinned people? Columbus infers there was people from the coast of Guinea, West Africa. In 1936, Carter G. Woodson, sidebar right here, we gonna do it, but there's some more gunshots in the thing, in the barrel. So I'm gonna say Carter G. Woodson for a little bit later, you know what I'm saying? But he wrote on it too. R.G. Woodson published in his book, The Black African, The African Black Ground. This book and his additional information on pre-Columbian presence of the Africans in what is called a new world. Dr. Woodson's observation are that several authorities during the time believe that Africans discovered America long before the Europeans had any such dream for the Occident. It was all but in a state of savagery until awakened by contact by more enlightened Orientals during the crusade. The early European explorers of the Isthmus of Darren Found there in the cave, in the skull cave, skulls was identified as African. So Darren is in Panama. Soon as the anthropology observed also that the religion of the North American, North and the South American Indians is very much like that of the Africans. Professor Leo Weiner had previously made the same observation. In the language of the Indians, moreover, I discovered that certain words appeared originally in the language of the Africans, such as canoe, tobacco, and bakra. These, however, must not be confused with the African words like goober, yam, banjo, and voodoo, which are later brought to, from Africa to America. The culture and the philological evidence to support the claim that the Africans on the West Coast rose to such a high level of culture and maritime skill is apparent is more apparent with each new book on the subject. The matter is out of the realm of pure speculation. It can be now said with a certain degree that Africans braved the roaring waters of the high seas and established relations with the Indians of the Americas well over a thousand years ago. In the article, African Explorers in the New World by Harold G. Lawrence, Afiwanga, 1962, this statement is made. We can positively state that the Mandingos of Mali and the Sanghe Empires in the Western Hemisphere Indians, possibly Sanghe Empire and other possible Africans Crossed the Atlantic to carry on trade with the Western Hemisphere Indians. Further succeeded in establishing colonies, keyword colonies, throughout the Americas. During the 13th century, Mali, the greatest of these early two empires, built on the ruins of ancient Ghana, rose to become one of the leading nations in the world. Professor Lawrence elaborates on these early African voyages to the West in the following statements. It is more important to note here that the voyages across the Atlantic were resumed or continued during the reign of Akashki. Proof of this evidence by the fact that Columbus was informed by some men when he stopped by um, stopped at one of the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Africa that Negroes have been known to sail in the Atlantic from the Guinea coast in canoes loaded with merchandise steering towards the west. The same Christopher Columbus was informed by Indians of Hispaniola when his arrivals in the West Indies that they had been able to obtain gold from black men who come across the sea from the south and southeast. The dates of these accounts can coincidentally Coincide precisely with the same time as Case of the Great, who held sway over Sanghe. It must be added that America Vespuccio and his voyage to the Americas witnessed these same black men in the Atlantic during the return from Afri to Africa. Quote 15th and 16th century Spanish explorers and early American art, legends, and burial provide a principal source of information of what happened to these African seamen upon their arrivals in the Americas. In the effect, the Spanish conquistadors found dispersed all over the New World, small tribes who were from the very first considered Negroes, all right? The largest Negro county appeared to have been a permanent zone at Durban, where Bobawa sold them in 1513. American Indian legends about the account of black men who came from them from far off islands. Aside from the report that Columbus attained at Hispaniola, a notable tale is recorded in Peruvian traditions. They inform us how black men coming from the East have been able to penetrate the Andean Mountain. Furthermore, any traditions of Mexico and Central America indicate that Africans were born among the first occupants in that territory. Some Indians there yet claim descent from these same blacks. In the magazine, West Africa, for Saturday, June 7, 1969, there was an article by Davis Bateson entitled Africans Before Columbus. In this article, we are told that Columbus and other Early Europeans arrived in America came back with quite a bit of evidence, suggestive but not but inconclusive, that black people from Africa had already reached these shores. Various writers have pointed out from time and time over the past 20 years and more 
to the likely West African origins of black explorers, notable of the tribe of Mandes who have settled in Honduras. The tribe of Mandes, they still practice Islam to this day. That's a point of fact in general. And they still there, there. They got minds all type of stuff. The two newer books, The Introduction to African Civilization by John G. Jackson and The Art of Terracotta Pottery in Pre-Columbian Central and South America by Alexander von Matthew, the last, probably the most convincing evidence of pre-Columbian presence of Africans in the New World is contained. The book by von Matthew is heavily illustrated. Its visual evidence leaves no room for debate. In order to understand the magnitude of the second African impact on the Americas, it is necessary to look at it in two ways, both at Euro Europe and at Africa. The genesis of African troubles is in both places. During the later half of the 15th century, European nationalism was reflected in the expansion of trade in both slaves and manufactured goods. The marriage of Isabella and King Ferdinand gave Europe the unity to drive out the Moors. Both Spain and Portugal was becoming powerful Mediterranean nations. In 1488, Artemio Diaz sailed around the southern tip of Africa. About 10 years later, another Portuguese sailor, Vasco da Gama, saw past the point reached by, by, by Diaz with the help of an Arab pilot. Vasco da Gama reached India in 1498. For Europe, the door to the vast world of Asia was open. The consequences of the African slave trade and the central story of the consequences of the second rise of Europe. In these years between the passing of the Roman Empire in the 8th century, a partial unification of Europe through the framework of the Catholic Church in the 15th century. Europeans were engaging mainly in eternal matters. With the opening of the New World and the expulsion of the Moors of Spain during the later part of the 15th century, the Europeans began to expand beyond their homeland into a broader world. Their searches for markets, new markets, new materials, and new manpower, and new land exploit. The African slave trade was created to accommodate this expansion. The first Africans who came to the North were not in bondage, contrary to popular belief. Africans participated in some of the early expeditions, mainly with Spanish explorers. The best known of these African explorers was Ivesto, sometimes called Little Stephen, who accompanied the Vivaca expedition during the six years wandering from Florida to Mexico. The remarkable thing about Ivesto, who came to America in 1527, is his outstanding language. He learned the language of the Indians in a matter of weeks, Precisely, and because of his knowledge of herbs and medicine, was accepted by a deity by some tribes. In 1539, Ivesto set off from Mexico with a party of Fray Marcos de Nina in search of the famous seven cities of Caboba. When most of the expeditions, including Fray Marcos, became ill, Estevano went on alone and opened what became known as New Mexico and Arizona. A number of historians have stated that Pedro Nino, one of the pilots that commanded the Christopher Columbus ship, was an African. In this discovery in the Pacific in 1513, Alboa carried 30 Africans who helped clear the road across the isthmus between the two oceans. In the conquest of Mexico, Cortez was accompanied by a number of Africans. Incidentally, one of them was a pioneer of wheat farming in the New World. In the exploration of Chile, the exploration of Guatemala, Chile, Peru, and Venezuela, Africans arrived nearly 100 years before they reappeared as slaves in Jamestown in 1619. Thus, the Africans were major contributors in the making of the New World. They did not come here culturally empty-handed. Many of the Africans brought New World skills such as ironworking and leatherworking and carpentry. The determining factor of the economic and survival of the New World was the African. His labor developed the plantation system, which laid the basis of the economic system which we call capitalism. And most of the early means between the Africans and the Indians both saw their plight as being the same, strong against the common oppression. Sometimes their uprising was separate. Other times they fought together. This unit drove fears in the hearts of white. We all better describe their fear in this matter. To prevent the Africans from getting along with the Indians and the Indians from getting along with the Africans, the leaders of the white colonists developed an old but nonetheless effective policy of divide and conquer. In such usual case, as usual, in such cases, the master told the suborn group that they would be much better off if they kept to themselves. In spite of prohibition and propaganda, the black and Indians continue to attract each other. These attractions reached an important climax during the Seminole Wars in Florida. In the paper by Gloria Horsey, written at Cornell University in 1970, she maintained that slavery was the principal e issue leading to the First and Second of Seminole Wars. She, like Leroy Bennett, used new materials and insight and still looking at a neglected aspect of American history. The relationship between the Seminoles and the African Americans, Bennett said, led to the longest and most expensive of all Indian wars. 
The Indian settlements in the forest of Florida became natural shelters for runaway slaves. This brought pressure on the Seminole settlements from the slave owners who were losing valuable property. This situation subsequently led to the first and second Seminole Wars. The potential of what, of what Black and Indian relationship could be and for the protection of both people was reflected in these wars. Unfortunately, the potential was never developed. The early Black thinkers wrestled with this problem without successfully resolving it. Because the winters was long in New England and Black ladies could not be used all the way around, slavery in this part of there could not be as successful as in the South. All right, so that's enough right there. You know, it goes into another chapter. But as you read and as you've seen, as we have read and as we have seen, he ain't saying nothing about really about no black Indians and no stuff like that. That's your hand, Clark. You know, he said, as black people over here, we had colonies. Those colonies ain't ran to us. Those were Africans. Those are not so called Indians or what you want to call them. Those are Africans. So I don't know where they're reaching with all this. These are well documented African colonies in the Americas. I don't know where these cats is reaching with this stuff at. You know what I'm saying? Talking about they Native American. I don't get that. It just shows to me, it shows a kind of a, a misscholarship in history and stuff like that. Was some all of them get slain? slain? No, all of them not getting slain. You know what I'm saying? But did, they, did a lot of them get whacked and knocked off? Yeah, a lot of them got whacked and knocked off. And a lot got caught up in the game of being enslaved. But it was already over there. Was, like you said, the second and third way, it was already over here. They knew they was African. A lot of them, a lot of to this day, if you check out all of my videos on the site, they know that they still African to this day. They admitted to they self, you know what I'm saying? So I don't know where people coming up with this stuff that, you know, well, we're not African, we're Native American. No, 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 no. It don't, you know what I'm saying? Grandma said this, I understand that, you know what I'm saying? But that's not what it really had when it really went down like that. You know, it went down different ways. And it was all up and down North America, South and Central America. You know, they had these spots on. But this is Dr. John Henry Clark. He's saying it too, that you know what I'm saying? That these were African colonies in the Americas, not so-called black Indians. Okay? I got more bullets in the chamber just in case we want to pop off and whatever, whatever. It's not really that serious to me. You know, I'm gonna jump off of some matter of fact, I'm gonna jump off to something else right now on African history. But this one is not really that, it's just really just acidine. You could just read our our black scholars. And I ain't really touched all the black scholars. You know, a whole lot of people wrote about this subject. Martin Delaney wrote about this subject. Uh, Carter G. Woodson wrote about this subject, as you've seen. Ida B. Wells wrote about this subject. It's a lot of couple, it's a lot of people that wrote about this subject. Did you know what I'm saying? That's I don't know where the heck they get that's in the Library of Congress. But I don't know where they getting, you know, these cats getting their information from about that. You know what I'm saying? So this is a Kosky of Funday. Much love and subscribe to the channel.